Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Eucharist at Chester Cathedral this morning. A few notices before we begin the service. We have visiting choirs from two Episcopal churches in Chicago, from Grace Hinsdale and St. Luke's Evanston. So we're welcoming them. They've sung our services all week, which is wonderful, and we should enjoy their music today as well. Next week, we have said evening prayer. We have no visiting choirs. It's good to have Bishop Mark preach for us and to launch his book today. So do make your way to the shop and just in the entrance of the shop where there'll be cake and coffee and the book will be launched after the service. And we're also licensing Jonathan Green as the priest vicar today in this service. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we're going to have an installation of the cathedral as you enter. We used to call it Aslan's Cave. It's a sort of insert as you enter. And we're going to suspend discs or squares from there representing the community and individuals. I've taken it around to shops and places. We'd love you to take one yourself and to create one by coloring it in, doing pictures, sticking things on, whatever you like, on both sides if possible because they're going to rotate. And we're going to suspend them over the month of September. So if you think you could take part in that and come to the launch, we will invite you once you've done one. Um, you please ask at the back from Pat or myself and we will give you a whole envelope which explains what it's about and how you do it. Please do join in because we want as many community members as we can to be part of that. The theme is welcome. The idea is that we welcome everyone to the cathedral and everyone to Chester. So please do take part if you think you possibly can, representing yourself or a group that you're a member of. We also have Making Tracks here, number three. It's been opened and we've already got people coming. It is an incredible piece of work. Please do go, go and have a look at it. It's modelled on Milton Keynes, and there's a camera there which even shows Milton Keynes Station at the time. And on Milton Keynes Station, there's a photograph or television video of our model here. So do go and have a look at that during the week if you can. There is a charge for entry at the cathedral because of that tra making tracks. Just a reminder about receiving communion as well. You make your way to the front and go round the cathedral, please. We do have the common cup and we're not dipping, we're not intincting. So if you do prefer not to take from the common cup, just receive the wafer as usual and that's absolutely fine. So a moment's silence before we start the service.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And I add my own welcome to our Eucharist this morning. It's a delight and not at all nerve-wracking to have Bishop Mark standing on my left here as we welcome him to preach this morning and also to have Jonathan's licensing as Dean's Vicar. And of course, it remains a delight to have our American friends with us from Chicago singing the services for the last time today. It's been such a pleasure to have you here all week. All your works praise you, Lord and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes with the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, and were called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not well his son, but gave him for all of us. Will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, or powers, or height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will not be able to separate from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of the Lord. So may I speak by invitation of the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do be seated. It is very good to be with you on what is al almost an ordinary Sunday. I know that no Sunday is actually ordinary, but the bishop only really gets to come to his cathedral for the really big events most of the time. But one of the things that the dean and I are very keen on is that we continue to develop this ongoing partnership. And so it's great to be with you this morning. And I say almost ordinary, because I do get to license Jonathan later. So it's a bit odd, I mean, good odd, but uh, nevertheless, it's good to be with you this morning. There's a theologian called Paul Ricoeur, and he has this very helpful concept of what he calls second naivety. He says, when you come to the biblical text as a new Christian, you naturally come naively. You don't know what's in the text. You read it and you wonder it. David fighting Goliath, all very exciting. But as you grow in your faith, you naturally come to understand more, and you might do some theology and understand uh, textual criticism and so on and so forth, and you get very clever about the Bible and about your faith. But Paul Ricoeur says this is not the end point to which you should aim. He says, rather, we as followers of our Lord Jesus Christ need to aim for what he calls second naivety. The place where, yes, we understand about the languages that it's written and the cultural concept and this passage uh, relating to that passage and so on and so forth. But through and with all of that, we can come back to the living God as faithful, wondering, 
hope-filled, doubting, faithful, and trusting children. I have to say that concept is profoundly useful for me as I seek to serve in this diocese as bishop. I do seek to engage with theology, and if you stay for the book launch after this service, you will hear more about that side of work. But my own faith is very often nurtured in the deep simplicity of seeking to understand the Scriptures and follow Christ. And so it is this morning as I have come to prepare for this sermon. I have been captivated just by the first few words of the Gospel reading, and we're not going to get very much further than that this morning. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in a field. A mustard seed, compared directly with the purposes of God and with our trust in them, our faith. Compared for all manner of reasons, that which is tiny becoming that which is huge, that which is invisible becoming that which is clearly visible and with huge effects. And be in no doubt that mustard seeds were and are tiny. Can anyone see it? Tiny. Do not lose the simplicity of this image. That which is small becomes that which is large. Remember back to that first occasion upon which you said yes to the grace of God in your life. You may have done it before you even really knew what you were doing. But the decision itself feels small and perhaps almost in one way inconsequential. And yet day by day as you seek to follow Christ, His rule, His way, His love, His grace comes to shape all that we are. That which is invisible, in my case, prayed in the bedroom of a friend of mine when I was eight years old and I was stopping overnight at his house having gone to a church event, becomes profoundly visible as Christ rules in every part of our life. This week I was at the Nantwich show and I was placed on a dinner table with a local MP, with a member of parliament. He rather unwisely, in the opinion of some friends of mine, decided to take on the Bishop of Chester about whether it was right for the Archbishop of Canterbury to, quote, interfere in political affairs. I asked him whether he felt it was right for MPs to interfere in religious affairs and pointed out to him that we had a duty to speak up for those who could not speak for themselves and to contend for issues of justice. That which is invisible becomes visible. Perhaps most tellingly in my own thoughts this week and prayers, what do you feed birds on? I'm no great ornithologist, but the bird food I have for the birds in my back garden is seeds, tiny seeds. I'm so rubbish at gardening, I've got no idea whether any of them are mustard seeds, but I imagine birds would quite like to eat them. But what happens in this parable? That which was bird food becomes the very place where the birds shelter. So we may be attacked, whether it's for speaking politics or for anything else in our faith. But as it grows, it builds a whole society in which all will shelter. And yet if we stay at this level, we miss the central point of this parable. And that is its humorous effect. I don't know if you noticed Jesus telling a joke, although be careful when you read parables and you do not notice Jesus telling a joke, because if you don't see the joke, you probably have not understood the parable. That's a serious theological point. Mustard seeds grew mustard trees, and they grew prolifically. I am told they still do. In parts of the world, they are regarded as being oversized weeds. Get one in your field, and you will end up with a field full of them, 
for they have many tiny seeds which disperse when the pod explodes. If you were a first century farmer listening to Jesus saying this, and you heard him say, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field, you would splutter in your first century ale and say, whoa, hang on a second, why would you do that? Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed of Japanese knotweed, which someone took and sowed in their garden. It gets everywhere. And there are various points that seem to me to flow very clearly from this. Firstly, notice that everybody has faith. The question is not whether you have faith. It is whether you have faith in the right thing. Secondly, notice that God is able to do God's own work. We are not called to do it for him. We are called to do it with him. This plant will self-propagate but God calls you into partnership with him. Do not imagine that you can ever contain Christ, that you can limit him, that you can put him to one part of your life or your world, for he wishes to be part of all that you are, all that you hope for. And this is vital. You see, there is a very real danger in the church that we will assume that we are doing God's work. But the question is, and always will be, is Christ at the center of it? Earlier on, I licked my finger, and I dipped it into a contact lens case that I have, and I held it up and asked who could see the mustard seed. And you all dutifully shook your heads, I can't see it, Bishop, which is a wise thing to do for there was no mustard seed upon my finger. And yet, because I'm a bishop and a preacher, you assume that there is. My sisters and my brothers, it is so easy in the world of the church, as we follow our forms and practices, to assume that Christ is at the center. Jonathan, in a few minutes, I will be licensing you as Dean's Vicar and as my domestic pastoral chaplain. Your task above and beyond all things, for the dean, for this community at the cathedral, and from my selfish point of view, most especially for me, is always to bring us back to Christ. Always to draw us to his grace and to his purpose. For there are many times in my foolishness that I rush off to do all manner of things and only later pause to wonder whether I have really followed Christ. There are so many times when I face challenges and only later slap myself around the face with a metaphorical wet fish and ask myself why I did not pray earlier. You are to be one who draws us back to Christ. For faith is tiny, it's often missable, but it is faith in Christ which transforms everything. You know this, but let me remind you of your simple task as you are licensed. And my sisters and brothers, what is true for Jonathan is true for each of you. Those around you who do not yet know Christ will often tell you you are foolish to place your trust in something which is so apparently insubstantial. But it is Jesus who changes everything. It is Jesus who enables us to love, to forgive, to hope, to embrace the outcast, and to transform society one life at a time. In this diocese today, there are 1.5 million people who have no meaningful contact with this message of hope. All we have is one tiny mustard seed. But in Christ, we do have that mustard seed. And not only will it grow into a tree large enough for the birds to nest in, it will self-propagate in ways that you and I cannot begin to imagine. And so come to Christ, the one who invites you in foolishness and apparent naivety to be part of his purposes of grace. For in him, all things will be brought to completion. In his most holy name, amen.
we declare our faith together in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Do sit down. Bishop Mark, uh, for some time, Jonathan Green has been ministering to us here in this cathedral, uh, both in our administrative affairs and in our worship. Uh, the cathedral community has much appreciated uh, Jonathan's work and his presence and has now called him into a new role here. So after due consultation and prayerful consideration, I present to you, Jonathan Green, to be Dean's Vicar in this cathedral church and also your domestic personal chaplain, pastoral chaplain. Sorry, I knew I was going to get that wrong. Thank you, Mr. Dean, both for this and for your ongoing partnership in all that we get to do together. Jonathan, do you believe, as far as you know your own heart, that God has called you to share in the mission and ministry of this place? I believe that God has called me. And a question for all of you gathered here today. Will you support Jonathan and share with him in worship and witness, in mission and in pastoral care? We will. So I call upon each of you to pray not only for Jonathan, but also for yourselves that together we may be given grace to glorify God and serve the people of God in this place and around this diocese. Almighty Father, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer for your servant Jonathan, that he may be strengthened in your service and filled with love for your people as a faithful priest and true disciple of your son, the Good Shepherd. May he preach your word, minister your sacraments, care for your people, and lead us in prayer and in mission through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now then, I think we need to do oaths and decks, don't we? Have I got the old version of the text in there? Anyway, I've got them here. It's all right. I'll do them. I'm just, uh, can you hold that while I put my hat back on? Uh, apologies to those on the screen if I've done things out of order. But there are some legalities to do before I license you. The Church of England is part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, worshipping the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It professes the faith uniquely revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds which faith the Church is called upon to proclaim afresh in each generation. Led by the Holy Spirit, it has borne witness to Christian truth in its historic formularies, the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. 
Jonathan, in the declaration you are about to make, will you affirm your loyalty to this inheritance of faith as your inspiration and guidance under God in bringing the grace and truth of Christ to this generation and making him known to those in your care? I, Jonathan Samuel McKibben Green, do so affirm and accordingly declare my belief in the faith which is revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds to, and to which the historic formularies of the Church of England bear witness. And in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use only the forms of service which are authorized or allowed by canon. I, Jonathan Samuel McKibben Green, swear that I will be faithful and bear true wit allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III, his heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. I, Jonathan Samuel McKibben Green, do swear by Almighty God that I will pay true and a canonical obedience to the Bishop of Chester and to his successors in all things lawful and honest. So help me God. Thank you. Mr. Dean, could you restore your archidiaconal sense and just oversee the signing of that for a moment? There's a pen over there, just on the paste stools, I think. Wonderful. Now, Jonathan, you're going to have two licenses, although I'll read them as if they're one, but I will then present both to you. We mark, by divine permission, Bishop of Chester, to our beloved in Christ, the Reverend Jonathan Samuel McGibbon Green, Clerk in Holy Orders. Greeting. We do hereby grant you our license and authority to serve as Dean's Vicar of our Cathedral Church of Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary in Chester, under the direction of the Dean thereof, in accordance with your duties determined by the chapter of Chester Cathedral, and therein to perform all ecclesiastical duties belonging to that office. And we grant you our license and authority during our pleasure to preach the word of God, to read the common prayers, and minister the holy sacraments, and otherwise to exercise the ministry of your order at any time and place within our diocese and jurisdiction, at which the incumbent or other competent authority shall assent to you so officiating. And we direct that so long as this license shall remain in force, you shall be known as our domestic pastoral chaplain. In testimony whereof, we have set our hand and caused our Episcopal seals to be affixed this 30th day of July, in the year of our Lord, 2023, in the seventh year of our consecration and of our translation, the fourth. Jonathan. Receive this ministry, which is both yours and mine, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you this day and forever. Amen. Thank you. Service, just come and stand up here for a moment. Uh, and you are allowed just for a moment to pretend you are Pentecostal. You can clap, you can cheer. You can... Wait, 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 not, not so soon. That was a great practice because I've still got my line to say. I present to you, Jonathan, your new Dean's Vicar. Hey! Well done, Jonathan. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. 
in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ. Let us pray to the Father. God of those who serve, we thank you for Jonathan, for his good humour and friendship. Give him love and faith to continue serving you so that he may remain a strong support to all those whom he knows already through his work at the cathedral and the strength to develop its mission to those who come seeking for comfort and for a new way of life. Support all bishops and clergy so that in all they do, they demonstrate the love of God and inspire others to follow the way of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all the people of Christ, inspire us not to be afraid to be the mustard seeds in a world that often seems like a barren field where our attempted good actions will come to nothing and our faith will wither. Let us never feel alone and powerless, but truly believe that we are eternally supported by your love and that through our continuing faith and hope, finally the seeds can flourish and the wilderness can blossom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all creation, here we bring before you all our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are living in pain or poverty or isolation and who face the future only with fear. Strengthen our resolve to act every day for those whom we are in danger of forgetting from one week to the next. We bring before you today, especially fishing families in Yemen, eating only when there is a catch, no longer able to afford school fees, forced to marry off young girls to reduce the number of mouths to feed. Make us constantly aware, too, of families in this country who dread the holidays as a period when school meals disappear. Housing, especially for homeless people, is too small to play, and entertainment and travel are too expensive even to consider. Give us arms to welcome those fleeing from war, and to those persecuted for their faith, or ethnicity, or sexuality. Give us eyes to recognize all those already suffering extreme results of climate change, and our own part in creating that change. Fill us with your spirit, so that we see the future of all your people and creation as something for which we have a duty to pray and to act. Help us to show your love for all in everything we do. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, comfort all those who are sick in whatever way. Be with those who love them and those who care for them. And here today, we pray especially for Jim Maddox and Tom Ryan. And we pray for others in any sort of need known to us. Lord, in your mercy, God of grace, support and comfort all who mourn as we br bring before you all who have died this week, whether at home or in hospital, in refugee camp or in war, 
whether old or young, whether from age or sickness or violence or starvation. Let us remember all of them, all of equal worth to you. At this time, we remember in this cathedral, Marguerite Elliott and Francis Cooper. May they and all the departed rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy, open our eyes every day this week to how we can be the leaven in the world, seeds of your kingdom, never afraid to fight selfishness and destructiveness and to stand up for our beliefs. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We offer one another an appropriate sign of peace. Wise and gracious God, you spread a table before us. Nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. 
Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning you have created all things, and all your works echo the silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech, that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we may find a voice to sing your praise. How wonderful the work of your hands, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus, our Saviour, born of Mary, to be the living bread in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms on the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ, and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at the last with all the saints to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Strengthen for service, Lord, the hands that have taken holy things. May the ears which have heard your word be deaf to clamor and dispute. May the tongues which have sung your praise be free from deceit. May the eyes which have seen the tokens of your love shine with the light of hope. And may the bodies which have been fed with your body be refreshed with the fullness of your life. Glory to you forever. Amen. Would you please stand? And so now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and all for whom we have prayed this day and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.
bless the Lord.